Hello and welcome. This is Cheryl. Thank you so much for joining me today. Today I'm going to create some shaker cards with dimension. I'm going to use this new coastal view die set. I'm going to use the fish and the shells from that. And I'm going to color some of them with the Cloud9 iridescent inks. Some are going to be using solar paste and some are going to be using lunar paste. So I'm going to create a bunch of different textures on paper for the die cuts with the pastes. And then with the ink pads, I'm going to ink the different die cuts cuts. I'm also going to be doing some foiling with some underwater themed foil plates. We'll get to that in just a moment. First, I want to take my solar paste and my lunar paste and I want to spread it on some cardstock so that I can set that aside to dry. I have three different colors of my lunar paste here and I'm just putting a tiny little bit of each one on the edge and then I have a large scraper that I'm using to move it across the paper. I'm trying to blend a little bit between the pink and the blue there to create a bit of a purple and trying to blend a little bit between the green and the blue as well. I get more purple from the pink and the blue than I do get between the green and the blue but that's okay. So the next one I'm going to do is the lunar paste. I always get lunar and solar mixed up in my head. So this one here, it has an iridescent shine to it and it looks completely different on black cardstock than on white cardstock. So when I have a little blob here, you don't see a whole lot of a difference, but once I go to move it out and scrape it out, you'll see. On that white, you get just a little bit of an iridescent color tone difference there. You don't really see a whole lot of color, but it has some gorgeous iridescent shine. Look at what it does on black cardstock. And this is one of the beauties of iridescent products. Um, I love the fact that they look completely different on white than they do on black. So I'm going to move that paste on that cardstock and I just have a thin layer there. I don't need a whole lot. I just want to create some iridescent and paste or just shimmery different colors of cardstock to use for my die cuts later. And it's just, you can use specialty cardstock for this. You don't need to use paste if you don't want to. It's just a different way to use those pastes and to create some unique cardstock. Next, I'm going to be doing some glimmered images. So this is the seahorse kisses no seahorse floral glimmer plate i'm using some moon dust glimmer foil on there i'm foiling on hammer milk cardstock put my plates on press the timer button and once that goes off i'm putting it through my spellbinders platinum six die cutting machine you need both the heat and the pressure for hot foiling and look at how gorgeous that image is i absolutely love this plate only thing that could make it better if there was a coordinating die cut for that plate but that's okay. Now I have the under the sea glimmer plates and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm using that same moon dust glimmer foil, putting the pretty side of the foil against the plate. My glimmer machine is all nice and hot and I'm once again foiling on hammer mill cardstock. Put the plates on top, press the timer button and once that goes off, it is going to go through my platinum six machine again. And then I can take that sandwich off and remove the top of the foil. Now, all of these foils I'm putting to the side, I'm going to use my solid hot foil plate and do the negative foiling of them as well. Now I have a Seahorse Kisses Sentiments die set, and this creates three different sentiments. One of them is under the water theme. It says Starf uh, Starfish Wishes and Seahorse Kisses, and the other two can be used for any occasion going to do those and here I did get a bunch of overfoiling. So the easiest way to get rid of some of that is to use a soft brush and just brush some of that excess away. Any of the stubborn overfoiling that wants to stick to my cardstock, you can use this Tombow sand eraser and remove that. You just want to be careful with that. You don't want to be going over your foiled image because it does change the surface of it. It makes it a little bit dull. It makes it scratched. So be careful with that sand eraser. Now I'm going to use my solid hot foil plate and foil those solid images. Some of these I'm going to be using in the cards. The under the sea pieces I'm going to be um, die cutting out and the sentiments I'm just going to be using the excess from that to be die cutting and some of these I'll be using with this project some will be for future projects but we might as well use or get as much use out of all of that foil as possible there's no point in it going to waste and while my machine is already hot I might as well do those solid foiling as well. 
So here is my specialty cardstock with the paste. I'm going to be using some of them to die cut the shell that comes from that coastal view die set. And then some are going to be used for the fish. Now, both of these have two different layers to them. So they're really, really easy to layer and know exactly where each layer goes. I'm gonna be doing a bunch of each one of them. Some of these pieces are gonna be used with this project and some are gonna be used for a future project. When I have my stuff out, I always like doing extra because once it comes time to put the card together, I don't want to stop and have to die cut an extra piece because I wanted it. I'd rather have more than I need. I can always use them for future projects. Sometimes you just need a little die cut or whatnot and it's always nice to have it completely inked, foiled, whatever, ready to go. So for my, these are just die cut out of white cardstock and black cardstock, and I'm going to be using the Cloud9 Interference inks with them. First thing I like to do, as always, is on the white cardstock, I like to do a little bit of black inking. I have these on a grip mat, and I love this grip mat for larger pieces. Not so easy, it doesn't work so easy with smaller pieces, especially if you're only trying to ink the edges, which is what I'm doing here um, with the black. So you'll see that I have to take my die pick and hold that piece down. It works a lot better when I go to use the detailed ink blending brushes with those Cloud9 ink pads because then I'm inking over the whole piece. The only time I find it's a little bit uh, finicky is when I'm tr just trying to ink blend the edges on small die cuts. Once I have this done, I have a different detailed ink blending brush for each one of these ink pads and I'm going to ink each one of the fish and I'm going to do the inking on both the black cardstock die cut as well as my white inked one. So the first color here that I'm using is called fruit salad and you can see that it has a beautiful coral color on the white. On the black it has a little bit of a gold yellowy tone to it and a lot of that color on the black you don't really see a whole lot of it unless you tilt it in the light. For the next pad that I'm going to be using, it's Peacock Tails, and this one has blue on the white cardstock, and then it's gonna show up as a purple iridescence on the black. And once again, you don't really see a whole lot of that color, when, especially on the camera, when you're looking at it, but you do see it when you tilt it into the light, and it's absolutely gorgeous. These are perfect, these ink pads are perfect for fish, because you know how their scales are a little bit iridescent, or a little bit, Usually um, there's a little bit of a shine in the light that shines a bit of a different color, makes it perfect for this. The last Cloud9 interference ink pad that I'm gonna be using is Summer Garden. And this one is going to be green on the white. And then on the black, it has a little bit of a blue tone to it. And these detailed ink blending brushes are super easy to die or to use to color these pieces here. And I do have a brush for each pad. You don't necessarily need to. You could take that excess color and get it off on a scrap piece of paper. Um, personally, I just like to have a bunch of these detailed brushes and I have them labeled for which one I'm using. So I have a bunch of my die cuts already glued together, but I do have a couple here that I'm going to glue together. I have this little um, kind of grid box. It had laser cut die cut or laser cut wood pieces in it at one time and I just save it. It's perfect for uh, pieces or things like this where I have a bunch of different die cuts, a bunch of different selection. Makes it easy to contain them and move them around on my desk. This seahorse floral foiled image. I want to create a mask for it. I want to do an ink blended background, but there's no die for this particular thing so I can't just die cut a mask for it. Easiest way to do it is use some stays on ink on my glimmer plate, press it down onto some masking magic sheets, and then I'm gonna let that dry. It doesn't dry immediately. You do wanna give it a little bit of time to dry, but once it is dry, you can use some detailed cutting scissors and cut all around it. It's not the funnest job, but it doesn't take too long. And this particular mask, when I'm done using it, I can put that backing right back on it. I store it with that foil plate because if I'm ever gonna to wanna to use it again, it's when I'm using that plate. And I can use it over and over again multiple times. For my backgrounds, for both my circle as well as this rectangle here, I am using some old paper on the bottom on my ocean floor here. And then for the oceany colors, I'm using speckled egg at the top, salty ocean in between, and then uncharted mariner 
on the bottom. And I wanted to have three different blues to create kind of a ombre light to dark effect for that. So you'll see me start at the top with that speckled egg. I'm using the same ink blending brush for all three of them. But when I do, I'll typically like to double ink blend. So I'll do it once and then I'll go back again going from the darkest to the lightest. And when I do that, I will often just ink blend until I don't really have much ink left on my brush and then go into the next colored pad so that I'm not contaminating them. And I find that by doing the double ink blending, you get a little bit more of a smoother ink blend. You get a little bit more ink on there. So it does make it a little bit heavier. So if you want lighter ink blending, probably don't want to do it twice but I also find that you get kind of a smoother blend between each one of the colors. You'll see that I'm going from off of the cardstock to on the cardstock. That way I'm not gonna get a mark from my ink blending brush with lots of ink on it. By going off or starting off of my page and then moving myself on, I can take some of that excess ink on there and I can control exactly how much goes onto that cardstock. You can see as I'm doing this the second time that it does get a little bit darker, but I also get a better ink blend between those colors. And this is the easiest way to create a nice background. By having that mask over that seahorse image, I don't have to be careful when I'm doing this ink blending. I don't have to worry about any areas that I don't want to get ink on. I can just worry about getting a nice blend for that background. With those backgrounds done, I can clean off my desk and then I can remove that mask. And I do that really carefully just because there are some jogs where there's some leaves or seaweed and I wanna make sure that I don't accidentally rip it. It does come off really easily. The stick on it is kind of like a post-it note. So it sticks really well while I'm ink blending, but it also comes off really easily. Put on those back backings and once again, I'm just gonna store that with that glimmer plate. And then I can start coloring my images. I'm gonna use a few different ink pads here and I'm just using some detailed ink blending brushes in order to do this. It comes together really, really easily, but you could also, if you wanted, you could use some markers in order to color your images as well. I have also done it with watercoloring. This cardstock that I'm foiled on is Hammer Mill. It doesn't really like watercoloring, but it is possible. And I did do another video with this glimmer plate where I did some watercoloring and I will link to it at the end of this video. Like I said, this paper doesn't really love it, but at that time I wanted to use some Magicals with it because I wanted to have that um, shine that you get from the Magicals. And the foiled image was best on the Hammer Mill cardstock. So it is possible, it just doesn't necessarily love it. So the first color that I'm using here is Scattered Scrub scattered straw and I'm using it on the seahorse and then I'm going to use it on a couple of the shells. I am using that detailed ink blending brush and you can see I'm starting at the edge of my image. That way the color is going to be the darkest there and then I'm blending it towards the center so I get a little bit lighter in the center of the image. On some of the edges I will take the edge of my brush and kind of um, flick it in once again to get that darkest color around the edges and have it lighter going in. The second color that I'm going to be using is saltwater taffy and that's that coral color and I'm going to be using that for some of the shells and the, some of the flowers. And then I'm going to be using bundled sage for the seaweed, that's the green color there. And I will use it on the edge of one of the shells just so it's a little bit different from some of the other colors. Because I have those die cut fish with all sorts of different colors, I was trying to be minimal with my colors here for coloring it in. And when you saw that tray with all of those die cut fish and whatnot, I don't intend to use all of them for this particular or these particular cards. I once again wanted to have a whole lot of choice. I'm going to be using some of them, others I'm going to save for a future card. So you can see the coloring here comes together really, really quickly and easily. You could also use like Tombow markers for coloring this. I've also colored glimmered images with Copic markers and that works really, really well as well. So you have a lot of options when it comes to coloring. 
Again, I wanted to keep things as simple with as minimal colors as possible. And I thought about coloring this with Copics, but then I figured the amount of different Copic colors that I would need or want in order to color all of the images would be a fairly long list. So I figured this was the easiest way to keep some of the colors a little bit minimal. And because I intend to use the die cuts for layers in front to create some of that extra dimension, I didn't want a lot of colors in the background and I figured a lot of that background was going to be um, covered anyways so I didn't think it needed a whole lot of detail because a lot of what you're going to be seeing is the things in front of it. Now the foiled images from the underwater or under the sea glimmer plates I only have one of them here I'm going to use one of them on that circle background so I'm only coloring one of them the other ones I will color when I'm going to use them. I don't wanna have them all colored and be stuck to that color palette if it might not be something that I wanna use for those pieces for the project that I'm using them on. I also find that some of these glimmered images, especially the ones with the solid foil, don't really need a whole lot of inking. They're perfect as they are. So I just leave them as is. I'll easily color them at the time when I'm using them if I want to. Now for the shells as well as the seaweed, I'm doing the same thing as I did with the seahorse. I'm starting where I want the color to be darkest and ink blending out. I'm making the color darkest in the center of the flower. And then when it comes to the seaweed, I'm making it darkest where it twists or where one piece goes behind another or it starts from behind the shells. I'll make them a little bit darker there. So I'm just getting a little bit of shadow for it that way. Um, that way I have a little bit of dimension and I'm not using a whole lot of colors. I'll get some lights and darks from that same ink pad, but not adding extra colors to this background. For that clamshell, that the last one there, I did some of that green in the bottom part of it. And then I'm using some of the yellow on the outside. So the bundled sages at the bottom, scattered straw is on the outside. Just to get both of those colors in there, I kind of figured that there was a lot of green in the seaweed, but there was nothing in the shells and I didn't want just those shells and flowers to only be the scattered straw and saltwater taffy. So I tuck in, tucked in a little bit of green there. Now for this under the sea die cut piece, I did most of the coloring with the distress inks, but when it came to that fish, I really like the cloud nine inks and how they look different on the black and white. So I chose one of those pads. I took my black ink pad and then ink blended around the edges of the fish, just to give it a little bit of that iridescence on those edges so that you'll see a little bit of the coral color as well as some of that gold shine on the black. So I did this exact same shading basically as I did on those fish die cuts, put a little bit of that black on the tail as well as the top and the bottom, and then use that detailed ink blending brush to ink blend over top of it. That black dries really, really quickly, so I didn't really have to worry about getting much contamination from that black ink pad onto my um, fruit salad cloud nine iridescent ink pad but you could if you want to take a dry cloth and just brush it just to get any of that excess off if that's what you're worried about the last thing I did with my image before setting it aside was take a paintbrush and use some of that lunar paste on the inside of the shells as well as on the outside of the clamshell it's just going to give it a little bit of iridescence a little bit of that shine to it it doesn't add a whole lot of color but you know how like conch shells have that iridescent shine to it. I thought it'd be beautiful to add to this. And in honesty, you don't see a whole lot of that on the final product. I just love when there's different textures, whether it's from paste being painted over or from stickles or from glossy accent. I think it just makes things look a little bit more interesting when they're not completely flat and matte. Um, so I wanted to add just some different textures here. And this is a super easy way to do it because I already had that paste out. You do want to make sure to clean off your brush and make sure that that paste doesn't dry into that brush. I have some glossy accents here that I used for the eye of the seahorse as well as some air bubbles. And I'm going to set that aside to dry for um, probably about half an hour to an hour. 
If you ever want to test your glossy accents, the easiest way to test it is to have a scrap piece of paper and put a dot of glossy accents on the side of it there. And then if you wanna to touch it to see if it's dry, you can touch that scrap. You don't have to touch your project. I will typically do it and then leave and do other things around the house just to make sure that I am not in the area and don't mess it up. For the fronts of my shaker cards, I have a piece of acetate here as well as different frames. So the circle frame is from that coastal view die set. The rectangle frame is from Spellbinders A2 Matting Basics B set. Both of these are perfect for shaker cards and they're both die cut out of a dark, almost like a gunmetal uh, silver metallic cardstock. There's not a whole lot of shine to them, but it was perfect with the different colors in the images. I didn't want to add color to the frame as well. So while that acetate is drying on the frame, I have some acrylic blocks on top of it, making sure that it stays nice and flat. And I glue, I'm gluing everything together with some Barely Art glue in a fine tip bottle. That way I can make sure to get the glue exactly where I want it to go. I can move things around, shimmy things in place as I'm going as well. So as I'm building these pieces up, I'm not adding extra dimension behind my die cuts here, but you could certainly, if you wanted to, die cut some extra cardstock scraps and have those die cuts built up a little bit. Because I am putting them in a shaker uh, window, I wanted to make sure there was room for those shaker bits to go through. But if you wanted to add extra dimension to this, you certainly could add die cuts behind them, building them up a little bit more and having dimension that way as well. I'm just picking and choosing from the different die cuts. And I love the fact that there is so much choice in here. You don't need to have all of this choice. You don't need to have all of these different die cuts made with different mediums, but you certainly can if you want to. I like the different colors that come out of it. And I think it just looks makes it look really interesting to have all of the different finishes and the different textures. It does make it very busy looking. So if you don't like it this busy, you could leave some of those die cuts off of there, have a lot less or have a lot less color. So there's options if you wanted to customize it to your liking. I wanted to get kind of the feel of a piece of the ocean with a ton of fish and a ton of different colors and a ton of different textures but it's definitely not necessary if that's not your cup of tea. So after everything is glued in place, I have some foam tape and I'm going to be using that on the back of the frames in order to pop that up for my shaker window. And while I do that, I'll have that acrylic block on my oceany beachy fish die cuts just to make sure that they are lying nice and flat to dry as well as freeing my hands for other things. So this foam tape that I have is really quite narrow. You could use a thicker foam tape if you wanted to. I had this really narrow stuff or I had some stuff that was wider than my frame and I didn't want to be bothered with cutting it. In order to make sure that I have lots of um, support there, I'm going to be using this foam tape on the inside of the window or inside of the frame as well as the outside of the frame. And any of those little pieces that I cut off, I typically will use them to fill in little areas. So you can see that I cut them off when it's a little bit too long, but I'll use them on other areas to um, fill those areas in. Now, I am only using one layer of this foam tape, but if you wanted your shaker window to have a deeper window, you could use, you could double layer it. Once one layer is down, you could take the backing off and do a second layer on top of it. You don't necessarily need to, but you absolutely could. And I didn't do it with this particular window, but you could also use some tiny seashells in your shaker window. That looks really great too. I have these, they're dew drops. They're from a long, long, long time ago. I didn't have any um, shaker bits that were round and just plain. So I use these dew drops. I'm also using these sequins. These are from that Spellbinders Crafty Advent Calendar. So I figured they were perfect for this. The colors were gorgeous with the colors that we're using here and they coordinated really, really well. So I used that in there. I was trying to kind of emulate bubbles, which is why I was using everything that was round. I put those shaker bits on the center of my image there and then take my foam backing off of that frame and put it onto my background. Now for the rectangle, that's how I found it easiest to do it is put my bits on 
the image and then put it on the frame, but it really doesn't matter because the outside of the rectangle and the outside of my image are exactly the same size. If you wanted to make sure to get perfect placement, you could also use the corner of your Misty and put your pieces in there and then line them up that way. I found it pretty easy to place those two and I figured if there was any um, anything that was a little bit crooked, I could easily just trim it off with scissors. So I didn't find the need to grab my Misty to make sure that, that I had perfect placement for that. For my circle frame, I'm just putting the foam tape on the center of that. Now, when I die cut this foam frame, it cut out little holes for rivets and you will see uh, the foam tape through there, but I will fix it once I have my card assembled. So once I have that foam tape there, I took the backing off of it. And then I started putting my shaker bits in the center of the window and realized that the outer edge of my image piece is bigger than um, my circle frame. So for this particular one, it's important to put those shaker bits in the center of the image piece and then put the frame on top of it so that you have that nice even um, edge around the hole outside there. And you can see how those shaker bits move around nicely and I have a ton of extra die cut bits for future projects. With those shaker pieces done, I thought I would work on my card bases. And because I have so many of those little die cut pieces, I thought for the one that the rectangle is gonna go on, I thought I'd put some of those die cut pieces on the inside of the card. And it's a great way to add some continuity from the front of your card to the center. I didn't color in the under the sea foiled image here. I wanted the die cut or the fish die cuts to be the star of the show. So I just kept it nice and blank, nice and simple, and then just had a couple of those fish pieces to go on top of there. And you can add as much or as little, but I wanted to make sure to leave enough room for uh, writing. And I typically like to put an odd number of those extra little die cuts. So I have three fish there. For the one with my circle die cut or circle shaker element, I took that seahorse floral negative image and I'm using that as a border around a white piece of cardstock for the front of my card. It just frames it in beautifully. I found that just having that circle on my card base, it was a little bit plain and it just needed something. So by having that frame and then the white cardstock piece in there, it just frames it nicely and doesn't make it look quite as bare. Off screen, I die cut some of these hibiscus flowers as well as these leaves. And I can't remember what kind of leaves these are. I'm not, a, I'm not, I don't have a green thumb. And I'm gonna put that below my circle shaker piece just to fill that in. You could also fill this in with a different sentiment. I liked these die cuts for it. And it also pulled in, I have that one pink fish in my shaker window and it just pulls in that pink in a different area of the card and makes that fish not stand out quite as much. So I put some of those leaves as the base and then I put this flowers on top of it. Now the center of this flower die cuts separately. So I die cut a few different ways with a few different areas of my um, pasted cardstock and then I inserted those pieces and just put some double-sided tape on the back of it in order to hold those centers in place. It also works well for gluing those pieces onto the front of the card. Then there's a little center or stamen part for that flower. I die cut that out of some scrap piece of yellow cardstock and put that in the center there. Now for those rivet holes that we can see some of that foam tape through, I'm just taking some silver lining crystal drops from Nuvo and I am just adding a little drop to the center. It'll just make them look a little bit more like rivets and it's going to cover up the white of the foam. You don't necessarily need to do this. I wanted that the look of that in there and I liked the look of it as well. And this is something that I had planned to do from the beginning. And once I saw the foam tape through those holes, I just knew it needed to be done. And here are the finished cards. They've got a lot of texture and dimension to them from all of those different die cuts made with different pastes and different inks. And there's just a lot going on there. Like I said before, you can definitely put less in there. You don't need to have as many die cuts, but I love all the texture and dimension that these shaker cards have.
And part of that dimension comes from the dimension of the shaker window, but some of it also comes from the layering of the die cuts. Another part of it comes from the different mediums that we put on our cardstock before die cutting them and the different inks that we used on our fish that have the iridescent shine to it. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Have a fantastic day.